I will now demonstrate the surprising and elegant fact that these basic properties, that the determinant of the identity matrix equals 1, the alternating property, and the linear property, actually imply this formula. In other words, these properties can be used as the definition of the determinant. And then this formula becomes a consequence of that definition. And that is certainly a very appealing approach to determinants. We mentioned this fact earlier in the overview video, where these three properties were also grouped together by a figure bracket for this very reason. And since then, we've shown that this formula actually implies these properties. But maybe there is another formula that has the same three properties. Well, I'm about to show you that there is not. How am I going to do that? Well, I will demonstrate that the determinant of any matrix can be evaluated by relying only on these properties. So if there were another formula that had the same properties, it would have to evaluate to the same number because I would use the same logical arguments for it. And so there can't be another formula. We will begin with a small 2x2 two two example, and then we'll discuss what happens for larger n by n matrices. And we will see that this formula will pretty much construct itself from these basic properties. OK, let's consider this 2x2 two two determinant. And it, of course, equals 2 times 5 minus 4 times 3 which is minus 2. And now I will think of its first column, because I want to use the linear property, as a sum of two vectors, 2, 0, and 0, 4. And now, by the linear property, this determinant can be represented as a sum of two determinants, where in the first one we have the first vector for the first column, and the other column is the same, and in the second determinant, we have the second vector in the first column, and the other column is the same. All right, what would we have done in the case of a 3 by 3 matrix? Well, I would have thought of its first column as a sum of three vectors, each one with a single non-zero entry. And then that determinant could be represented as a sum of three determinants, where the first column is borrowed from each one of these three vectors, and the remaining two columns are the same. And in the case of an n by n matrix, I would think of the first column as a sum of n vectors, each one with a single non-zero entry, and then the determinant would be represented as a sum of n determinants, where the first column is borrowed from each one of these vectors, and the remaining columns are the same. Okay? What's next? Next is doing the same thing in each determinant for the second column. We will now think of the second column in each determinant as a sum of two vectors, 3, 0, and 0, 5. And we'll apply the linear property to that column in each determinant. And now each one of these two determinants will become a sum of two other determinants, giving us a grand total of 4. OK, what are the corresponding actions for 3 by 3 determinants? Well, in 3 by 3 determinants, we would expand the second column as a sum of three vectors and then apply the linear property to that column. And so each one of the three determinants will become three other determinants, giving us a temporary grand total of 9. Why temporary? Well, that's because we're still not done we would still have to do the same thing to the third column in each of the nine determinants, represented as a sum of three vectors, each with a single non-zero entry, and then apply the linear property to that column. And then each of the nine determinants will turn into the sum of three, giving us a grand total of 27, 3 to the power of 3. What about the end by end determinants? Well, for n by n determinants, this process repeats for n steps. 
On the second step, it is the second column that will be represented as a sum of n vectors, each with a single non-zero entry. And then each one of the n determinants after the first step will split into n other determinants, giving us a total of n squared. After three steps, after we've analyzed the third column, we'll end up with n cubed determinants. And finally, after all steps are done, we'll end up with n to the n determinants. Now let's get back to this two by two case. What's next here? Well, you will notice that until now, all we've used was just one half of the linear property. Now it's time to use the other part of linear property, which has to do with multiplying columns by a number. And as you can see, each one of these columns can be analyzed according to part two of linear property. We can factor out the non-zero entry, leaving us here with one zero, one zero, one zero, zero one, and so forth. In other words, when we factor out these non-zero entries, the matrix will have columns that consist only of ones and zeros. So let me do that next. Okay, now we're completely done with the linear property. And it is now time for this property and the alternating property to shine together. Because each one of the remaining determinants can be evaluated with the help of those two properties alone. Let's take a look at the first one. The first one has two identical columns. Therefore, by the alternating property, or more precisely by a consequence, of the alternating property, this determinant is zero. So we're going to cross it out. Next is this determinant. And of course, this is the two by two identity matrix. And by the first property, its determinant is one. So this leaves us with two times five. Do you recognize it? Two times five. Moving on to the third matrix. This matrix is not the identity matrix but it's a single row switch away from the identity matrix. And by the alternating property, the determinant of this matrix equals minus one times whatever we end up with. And of course we end up with the identity matrix whose determinant is one. And therefore the determinant of this matrix is minus one. So maybe we'll put minus one in parentheses here. Moving on to this determinant, we have two identical columns, and therefore, according to the alternating property, or a consequence of the alternating property, this determinant is also zero, so we're going to cross it out. And so we're left with two times five minus four times three equals minus two. And you can see how in this simple two by two case, we were able to evaluate the determinant by using nothing but these properties. Now let's jump straight to the n by n case. Where did we leave that? We left the n by n case with n to the power of n matrices. Each one of those matrices has precisely n non-zero entries in them, just like here, each one of these matrices before the factoring out had exactly two or n non-zero entries. Next step is the factoring. We can factor n factors out of each one of those determinants, leaving us with these products of n entries from the matrix, sort of beginning to remind us of this. In fact, there is exactly one that comes from each column, because after we do this distributive analysis, we're left with matrices that have exactly one non-zero entry in each column. And now we're factoring it out. So we're getting once again these products of n entries, one from each column, to say nothing of rows. Okay, now we have matrices with only ones and zeros. And there's precisely a single one in each column, but not necessarily one in each row. In fact, you may have more than one one in each row, in which case 
the alternating property kicks in and kills that determinant. So out of the n to the power of n determinants, most of them vanish thanks to the alternating property. And once again, more precisely, that consequence of the alternating property, which states that when there are two identical columns, the determinant is zero. And after that elimination, how many determinants are we left with? Well, precisely n factorial, because the determinants that are not eliminated by this argument are the ones that have those non-zero entries, one in each row, because in that case, we're not able to eliminate them by the alternating property. And those are the surviving n factorial terms corresponding to permutations. And now I think you're really beginning to see how this formula is taking shape. So we have those products of n terms. Now they come one from each row and one from each column. So we have found our n factorial terms. The only thing that remains is to determine the sign. And the sign will be either plus one or minus one because the remaining determinants have values of one or minus one. By the alternating property, in combination with this property, it'll be one if the permutation that that determinant represents is an even number of swaps from the identity. Why? Because we'll start swapping the rows until we get to the identity, at which point the determinant will become one. So what was the original determinant? Well, if it was an even number of steps, then by the alternating property, the determinant is one. If it was an odd number of steps, then by the alternating property, the determinant is minus one. And so now you see how this formula has perfectly constructed itself from nothing but these basic properties. In conclusion, if you ever decide to write a book on determinants, you have two options, two ways of introducing determinants. You can do it as we did it, by formulating, by postulating the algebraic formula and then deriving these properties, or by postulating these properties and then doing what we just did, deriving this formula on the basis of these properties. The choice is up to you because the two approaches are equivalent.